copies to the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. And don't forget, we have Bible study this afternoon as well. Uh, we've been having a great time, as we have been for a long time in Bible study. And uh, it's a great time. It's a little different. We just meet over here in the Sunday school room, and it's an informal time. We get to put our input and ask questions and comments, make comments. And so we appreciate uh, Brother Dale, Pastor Dale, as he leads this. And he's the, one of the great things I love about it is he's encouraging others. He's raising up other teachers. How many know? And we're going to talk about this in the message, so I'm not even going to say any more about that. But we are to raise up the next generation of leaders. How many would say amen? 1 Kings chapter number 18 is where we will find our opening text this morning. How many are thankful for the Word of God? Uh, now, this is just another one of uh, these Old Testament jewels uh, that we have rediscovered here lately. It's rather a lengthy read here uh, this morning, but it's such a good story that uh, I hate to cut anything out, so we're just going to read it all together. First, First Kings chapter number 18, and we'll begin reading in verse number 17. And it says, And it came to pass... That when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Are you he that troubles Israel? Boy, now that isn't that a strange question? How many know the devil's a spin master? He's always trying to turn things around on us, right? But look at, look at Elijah's response here. He says, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal 450, and the prophets of the groves 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long? Will you halt between two opinions? Or in other, in other words, how long are you going to be in the valley of decision, right? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. In other words, make up your mind. Don't try to straddle the fence. One, fence, one foot in the world and one foot in the church, but make up your mind already. If God be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people answered Him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I... Even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under as well. And you will call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> and the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Well, that's, that, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. In other words, they were in agreement with what Elijah was saying here. Verse number 25, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which had, was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon. Okay, so they've had all morning. Everybody say they've had all morning. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah began to mock them. In other words, Elijah started to make fun of them here a little bit. And he said, cry louder, for he's God, and he is a God, and either he is talking or he is pursuing or in other words, he's busy, he's on a journey, or pre-adventure he'd be asleep and must be awake. And they cried aloud and cupped themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Wow. Isn't that uh, such a point of desperation? Wow. And it came to pass when midday was passed and they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither, neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. So we see here that the prophets of Baal prayed and cried and cut themselves and danced and did whatever they did all day long. Everybody say all day long. All day long. How many know God gives, gives everybody plenty of chances? Plenty of time, doesn't he? 
It, it's all to do with His grace and mercy and His long-suffering. And so all day they had to prove, prove themselves or their God. In verse number 30, And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And look at this now. And he repaired the altar of the Lord. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, then you know what we've been saying, that we must have the formula right. We must do it the way God wants it done. How many would say amen? And it says here that Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. Notice that. He put the wood in order. How many know everything God does is in decency and in order? There's plans. There's purposes with God. Nothing happens by happen chance in the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. But he put the wood in order. And he cut the bullock in pieces and laid uh, him on the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And how many understand by now the wood is wet? Look at your neighbor and tell him the wood's wet, honey. It's, it's not going to burn. How many understand wet wood does not burn? Verse number 35, And the water ran about the altar, and it filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now, while I was reading over this and preparing this message I asked the Lord, why did you wait all the way to the evening sacrifice? And I believe I heard this in my spirit. He said, listen, I always save the best for last. Right? I always save the best for last. And it came to pass at the time of the offering, after the prophets of Baal and whoever had their chance, of the evening that sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob or Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. <laughs> Woo! And that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God. How many know everything we do is to point people, places, and things to Jesus, right? He's the focus of our attention. He's the object of our worship, right? That the people may know that you are the Lord God and thou hast turned their heart back again. Then, everybody say then. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water. Wow, somebody say that was a fire. <laughs> licked up even the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And they took them and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. Wow, what a story. What a story. But how many know it's more than a story? It's reality today. Amen? Now, I wish we could just stop right there this morning and celebrate a great and awesome victory because how many know it was a great and awesome victory? But let me say this. It wasn't so much Elijah's victory as it was God's victory. Church, can I tell you that God wants to use you and I, His church today, to prove himself to a lost and dying world. Can somebody say amen? amen. So, so we say oftentimes that this was Elijah's victory over the prophets of Baal, but really it was God's victory. And I, I, I wish we could just stop here and savor this. And we will for the moment. <laughs> but, everybody say but. I hate to say that that isn't all of the story. As Paul Harvey would say, now for the rest of the story. Or page two. <laughs> now, before we read to you what happened to Elijah, 
immediately after. Everybody say immediately after. What happened to Elijah immediately after this great victory at Mount Carmel. I'm going to give to us the title of the message here today. And the title will tell it all. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him the title is going to give it away. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Here it is. Some of our greatest victories will produce some of our greatest battles. Hello? I wish I didn't have to admit that this morning, but some of our greatest victories will produce some of our greatest battles. How many have lived this right here? Amen? Now, since you know where we're going, let's go there. Look at your neighbor and say, let's go there. Let's go to immediately after the great victory that Elijah experiences at Mount Carmel. As we have read in your hearing today here in chapter 18. And now let's go to chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19 and we'll pick it up at verse number 1. And Ahab told Jezebel, how many know the devil likes to run his mouth? The devil never shuts up, does he? He's always accusing the brethren. He's always speaking lies, always stirring up drama. Come on, somebody. Always stirring the pot. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all, he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So in other words, Jezebel wasn't affected at all by what God had done. Hello? How many know some, some aren't just, there's some out there that aren't going to be convinced no matter what God does. I believe there's a lot of people in our world today that already have a reprobate mind already have their conscience seared with a hot iron that there's no hope for them. Some people have already made up their mind that they're not going to serve God, no matter what God does. And Jezebel was one of those. And how many know the Jezebel spirit is alive and well in 2019? <laughs> so let the gods do to me, she says, and more also, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Verse number 3. And when he saw that, this is Elijah, he arose and went for his life. Everybody say, oh, no. Oh, no. Here we go. And came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and Elijah left his ser servant there. So now we see that Elijah's on the run. Everybody say, Elijah's on the run. Wow. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. Wow, what a turn of events. And said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, the angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink, but then what did he do? Lay down again, and he went back to sleep. Why is, it, why is that the tendency of the church to when we need to be busy about our Father's business, we want to spiritually be asleep? Come on, somebody. Verse number 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, wow, and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because your journey is too great for thee. And he arose, and he did eat and drink, and went in strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Herob, the mount of God. Huh. How many understand that God wasn't going to let, let uh, uh, Elijah die yet because his job, his duty, his function on this earth wasn't complete yet? You know, isn't it funny how as, even as Christians we worry about our health and our life and our lifespan can I tell you, God's not going to let you go until he's done with you. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't going anywhere until God's through with you. Amen? <laughs> and so after the great victory at Mount Carmel, 
And after Elijah had it, called fire down from heaven and killed the 450 prophets of Baal, after the drought even had ended and the rain finally came, Elijah went from being spiritually on top of the world in chapter 18 to chapter 19 where he is lying under the juniper tree asking God to take his very life. What a turn of events. But doesn't it sound much like the life that you and I live today? Come on, somebody. On the mountain one day, way down in the valley the next day. Come on, let's just keep it real. Right? Isn't it amazing how one good victory will always get the devil's attention? One good win for the church, and the devil will come calling just like clockwork. Isn't it amazing how we step towards God? How we take a leap of faith. How we step out of our comfort zone. How we get involved. And guess what? The devil comes and says, oh, no. Uh -uh." (laughs) Uh-uh. You see, we can count on it. We'll have a blowout service. We'll have a great revival meeting. We'll experience some growth. Some great things will be happening, whatever it is. And that, that next week or that very same week, all hell will break loose in your life. Come on, somebody. Now, I'm not saying this to discourage anybody from doing the right thing, but I'm just saying we need to be aware. We need to understand how the enemy works. How many would say amen? How many know I'm telling you truth this morning? I'm not trying to give the devil any credit here, but I'm just saying. I'm saying this because the Bible tells us that we don't have to be ignorant of Satan's devices. That we should know when we take a leap of faith, that we, when we get involved with the work of God, when we do something for the kingdom of God, that the devil's not going to take that line down. When we win a major battle on our spiritual journey, we can expect hell to retaliate. Hello? I said when we press into the things of God, we can expect some retaliation from hell. Hell never takes our victories lying down. But the devil always retaliates. Ahab went back to Jezebel, started talking smack about Elijah and what happened. Man, I I think if I was Ahab, I might have went back humbly back home and said, you know what, we better be fearful of this man Elijah. We, we, We better start respecting the God of Israel. No, he starts talking crazy to Jezebel, stirring the pot. Ain't that just like the devil? But again, Elijah prays fire down from heaven, kills 450 prophets of Baal. The drought is over. I mean, life is good, right? Before we get to chapter 19, life is good in chapter 18. Oh, life is good. How many have ever been to the place called life is good? How many know it don't last very long? Right? Life is good for just a short time. And then all hell breaks loose, right? (laughs) But for Elijah, for uh, just a little while, a short time, life was good. I mean, after he had called fire down from heaven and killed the 450 prophets of Baal, after the, the drought was over and it had rained, TBN had come out and had interviewed Elijah. Hello, come on, somebody. All of a sudden, Elijah finds himself on all the talk shows. Right? He's a celebrity. I mean, Elijah's Facebook page and Twitter account are just blowing up all over. He's got more friends and likes than he knows what to do with. Elijah is getting ready to write a book. He's going to do a How to Kill series. Right? Right? All the churches are calling, wanting Elijah to come hold revival. Come on, Elijah, come tell us how you did it. I mean, Elijah was on cloud nine. He was on the mountaintop. Life was good. But all of a sudden, one little rebellious, evil woman 
threatens Elijah. And before you know it, he's running for his life. How many can say, I, I, I tell you what, I, I've been where Elijah was at. I've been on the mountaintop. I've experienced great victories. I've savored that victory in that <laughs> feel-good moment, right? Been to that place called life is good. But the devil always comes knocking. Isn't that just like the enemy of our soul? To try and threaten and intimidate the children of God. How many know we war against the spirit of Antichrist today? I don't ever want it to diminish what has ever happened before us. And I know the apostles and so many of those that went on before us have paid the ultimate price for the faith with even their lives. But I dare to say this, that there has never been a time like this today. The enemy is so cunning. The enemy is so bold and blatant. We know that he's come to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I don't think there's ever been a time like this when it's such in our face, when he's so bold. And may we never forget the fact that the devil hates us. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him the devil hates you. The devil hates us and he wants to take us out. Especially when we're doing something for the kingdom of God. Especially when we're making some noise over here. Come on, somebody. Oh, now as long as we're asleep under the juniper tree, he really doesn't care. But I tell you, if we're, on the, if we're on Mount Carmel and we're calling fire down from heaven and we're kill, killing 450 prophets about, I promise you the devil knows our name. I preached a message many years ago, does hell know your name? I know our name is supposed to be in the Lamb's book of life. But does hell know who we are? How many know hell needs to tremble every time we wake up in the morning? Oh, no, they're awake again. Come on, somebody. How many understand we all, we all have some kind of Jezebel in our life? Hello? <laughs> we, all, we all have some kind of Jezebel in our life who tries to threaten and manipulate and control us. Oftentimes, it's a person of influence. And I hate to say this, but oftentimes, it's a person in the church. Man, I hate to say that. I hate to admit that. But it's true. We all have some kind of Jezebel person in our life that controls and threatens and manipulates and plays games with us and mind control. And Come on, somebody. You know I'm speaking truth right here. And ladies, let me let you off the hook right now. It's not always a woman. The Jezebel is no respecter of person. The Jezebel spirit will use anybody. The devil hates us. The devil wants to take us out. Especially when we're doing something for the cause of Christ. But church, can I tell you, we can't necessarily take that personal. Because really, it's not about us. We're just caught in the middle. Look at your neighbor and say, we're just caught in the middle. Because you see, the beef the devil has really isn't with us. But it's with our Heavenly Father. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and don't forget that every time the devil sees a child of God, we remind him of the one who kicked him out of heaven. Come on, somebody. You say, Steve, why do we remind the devil of God? Because we were made in the image and the likeness of God. And every time the devil sees us, we remind him of the God of the universe. Amen. 
Can I tell you that the only way the devil can get back at God is to mess with you and I, God's children. The devil has no recourse of action against God anymore. The devil already knows his fate is sealed. His doom is coming. Not if, but when. Come on, somebody. And the only thing he can do to get back at God is to mess with his children. Now you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, let me ask you this. As a parent, do you like for anybody to mess with your children? So guess what? Guess where we get that from? We get that from our Heavenly Father. So do we see how we're caught in the middle here? Do we see? It's not necessarily about us. And I know sometimes we want to take it personal. I do. I want to take it personal. But we're made in the image and the likeness of God. And every time the devil sees us, we remind him of our Heavenly Father. And as human beings, we live in a universe where there is a battle raging between good and evil. There's a battle that is raging between God Himself and the devil. And as human beings, we are to be, we are to whom we yield our members to obey. Whose camp are we in? Whose side are we on? I hope we understand this morning that as human beings, we are either a pawn for the devil and his kingdom, or we are a servant of God and his kingdom. Remember? Remember the teaching? Man has authority on the earth. And that's why God needs us, and that's why the devil is trying to get us. Because both God and the devil need a body to work in the earth. So if you ever feel pulled, if you ever feel, feel spiritual warfare, how many feel spiritual warfare? Woo, Jesus. If you ever feel like you're being pulled from side to side, it's because there's a war going for your body. God wants your body so he can use it, and the devil wants your body so he can use it. Boy, isn't that an eye-opening revelation? You see, as born-again, spirit-filled believers, we have been adopted into the family of God. We have been adopted into a family that the devil and all of hell hates. Can I tell you right now, we're never going to make friends with the devil. We shouldn't care what he thinks about us. He's going to hate us. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. The family of God and the body of Christ, I believe, is the most hated group of people on the face of the earth today. It's not a certain race. It's not a certain political party. Party. It's the Christians. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. It's the family of God. That's who hell hates this morning. How many know the devil is a hater? And you see, the devil would just love to wipe out the church. Remember what John chapter 10 verse 10 says? The only reason the devil has come is to what? Steal, kill, and to destroy. That's the only reason he's come. Only reason. He hasn't come to abide with us and to coexist. How many know the world wants us to coexist with them? You see that little peace sign all the time, coexist? Oh, it sounds so good, doesn't it? But can I tell you, the enemy has no, no idea, or he has no intention of coexisting with us. So don't be tricked by that. Don't be fooled by that. The only reason he's come is to steal, kill, and destroy. But the bad thing about it is he comes as an angel of light. I said the bad thing about it, he comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The bad thing about it, he comes as a Jezebel that tries to control and manipulate the move of God and the house of God and the flow of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. 
But church, can I remind us this morning that we serve an all-powerful God. We serve, a, we serve a sovereign God, the God of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Come on, somebody. Actually, we serve a God who's already won the battle. We just got to fight the war. Come on, somebody. Amen? The God whom we serve is victorious. He watches over his word to perform it. But not only does he watch over his word, thank God he watches over his children. Come on, somebody. Woo, look at your neighbor and say, God's watching over us. God's got our back. God's got our back. Yeah. And if we'll stay on, our, if we'll stay on God's, God's side, we'll be all right. <laughs> now, we know that Elijah finally comes to his senses, right? The angel finally convinces him to get up and move on. And he goes and he does his job as the prophet of God. And how many know we all have a job to do? We've all been called to fulfill something. Amen? But watch this, because even though Elijah didn't get to see the death of Jezebel, before the Lord took him in a chariot of fire, how many remember the story? Even though Elijah didn't get to see the death of Jezebel, he did get to mentor another prophet by the name of Elisha. Woo. How many realize that God has called you to mentor someone? Probably many someones. Look at your neighbor this morning and remind them we're all leaders. We're all leaders. Oh, you say, you say Steve, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Because you know what? If you can be led, you can lead. Yeah. Write that down. Somebody needs to write that down. This is revelation to somebody this morning. If I can be led, then I can lead. If I can be fed, then I can feed. Come on, somebody. If I can be led, then I can lead. If I can be fed, then I can feed. Say it with me. I'm a leader. I'm a leader. It's the enemy that lies to us and tells us we can't lead, that we can't raise up the next generation. You see, if the enemy has his way, we'll be asleep under the juniper tree while, hell, while, he, while the earth goes to hell in a handbasket. Just keep saying, I can't lead, and watch your children go to hell. Just say you can't lead and see another generation lose out with God. It's the enemy who tells you you can't lead. Can I tell you if my flesh had its way, I would not be here. <laughs> Preaching would be the last thing on my list of things to do. But sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Either we obey God or we don't. Either we serve God or we serve Bell. Right? Not saying that I'm perfect and I got it all together. But you know, sometimes you just got to man up and do the right thing. Can I say it? Even when you don't want to. You got to crucify the flesh. You got to deny yourself. You got to take up your cross. How many still love me? You got to love me if you want to go to heaven. Come on. Elijah raised up the next generation. He raised up the next man of God, the next prophet of God. And then the Lord used Elisha to anoint Jehu as the next king of Israel. And does anybody know what Jehu had the privilege of doing? Does anybody know what Jehu had the privilege of doing? He didn't call fire down from heaven. He didn't get to kill 450 prophets of Baal. He didn't deal with the symptoms. He went after the root of the problem. Come on, somebody. He went to Jezebel's house himself. Woo! Lord, how many?
of mercy. Something Elijah didn't get to do. And that was kill Jezebel. Mm, mm, mm. How many know that in our spiritual journey, we might not always get the opportunity to kill the queen bee? But I tell you what, if we don't get to kill the queen bee, then guess what? We're raising up the generation behind us that will. If we don't get to usher in the move of God, then guess what? We're raising up the generation that will. Come on, somebody. If we don't get to take Lincoln, Illinois, then guess what? We're raising up the next generation who will. Come on. Let's look at it here in 2 Kings. Let's look at what Jehu got to do that Elijah didn't. 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 30, and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And look at the pride. Boy, you're talking about the ultimate narcissist. Look at the pride that Jezebel still had, knowing that he was coming to kill her, knowing she wasn't going to survive this. But what does she do? She takes the time to put on her makeup, fix her hair, get all pretty, Talk about a woman who was consumed by herself. Come on, somebody. Oh, I'm going to die. Hang on. <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest queen of them all? I mean, she had her cell phone out taking selfies the day I die. The ultimate narcissist. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her hair and looked out a window. And as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Had Zimra peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Remember what Elijah said? <laughs> you need to figure out who you're serving. Who's on my side? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And Jehu says to them, throw her down. Throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he what? Trod her underfoot. Wow. And when he came and was come in, he did eat and drink. Boy, it didn't bother Jehu at all, did he? <laughs> hey, let's go get something to eat and drink. <laughs> Just killed Jezebel. Wow, I love it. And said, go, see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. Oh, what a waste. What a waste, what a waste of power and authority and money and position. Wow, what a waste. Yeah. And they went to bury her. Watch this now. But they found no more of her than just the skull, the feet, and the palm of her hands. Woo, honey, you don't want to mess with God. I said, you don't want to mess with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Makeup or no makeup. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, this is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. My goodness. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung. Does everybody know what that is? Waste upon the face of the field. In the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. In her lifetime, the evil queen Jezebel caused Elijah and many of the prophets of God much grief. But in the long run, everybody say in the long run. In the long run, God had the final say so. Remember? Remember Elijah, Mount Carmel? The prophets of Baal had all day long 
But at the evening sacrifice, God had the final say so. There it was. We've seen it for Elijah, and now we see it for Jehu. In the long run, God always has the final word. How many understand the wills of God and the wills of spiritual justice sometimes grind slow, but they always grind sure? You see, the world says, well, if there's really a God, why does he allow all this stuff to happen? Why? Because of his grace and his mercy and his patience and his long-suffering. That's why. But I promise you the day will come when he will say enough is enough. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Let me say it again. The wills of God and the wills of spiritual justice might grind slow, but they always grind sure. Let's look at it here in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse number 11. Because sentence, everybody say sentence, or another word, judgment. Because judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil in other words the sinner man thinks you know what nothing has happened so I'm always going to get away with this how many know sin is deceitful though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that who that what that fear God, which fear before him. But it shall not be well with the wicked. Boy, it didn't turn out well with Jezebel, did it? Neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. Church, can I remind us that God will always deal with unconfessed and unrepented sin. May not be today, may not be tomorrow, might not be next week, but eventually God is going to deal with unconfessed, unrepented sin. It might take a while, but he always ends up dealing with it. In fact, God doesn't just deal with it, but he punishes it. My Bible tells me that the wages of sin is what? But not only that, God will always defend his children. Now, just like, I, just like I've told you my, my deal with Moses, you know, I wish Moses could have went on into the promised land, but I understand. I do. Don't agree with it, but I understand it. I wish Elijah could have seen Jezebel die just for the fact of how much grief Jezebel gave Elijah. But how many know everything is done in God's timing? God's timing. And the older I get, guess what? The more I'm learning that. Anybody else? The older I get, the more I realize, you know what? This is all about God's timing. Not only does it got to be according to his will, but it's got to be according to his timing. Timing. But know this, know that God will always vindicate his children. Remember what the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Look at this in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 9. I hope I can encourage somebody with this word today. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, or there it is in God's timing, that's what due season is. We shall reap if we faint not. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be the great prophet of God, Elijah? To have called fire down from heaven. To see God have your back and to prove himself. 
to kill 450 prophets of Baal, to pray and the rains come and the famine and the drought is done. But yet that very same Elijah finds himself sitting under the juniper tree in a state of confusion. Mm. If you'll notice carefully, it happens time and time again in the Word of God. Do you remember John the Baptist? Finds himself in prison. And he asks his disciples, will you go and make sure Jesus is still the one? Or do we need to look for another? How many know that the warfare that we are warring in has a way of messing with your mind, causing confusion? And how many know God is not the author of confusion? But if we could picture the great prophet Elijah lying under the juniper tree, he's so distraught, he's so discouraged that he even asked God to take his life. But aren't you thankful that even though weeping may endure for the night, joy comes in the morning. Angel says, come on, wake up, Elijah. You got work to do, man of God. Eat, drink. What does he do? He falls asleep again. But how many know God doesn't give up on us? Come on, somebody. How many are thankful he doesn't throw the clay away? The angel comes back. Elijah, come on, get up. You got some work to do. <laughs> My Lord. Weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Look at your neighbor today and tell him, endure your night season. Endure your night season. Because joy comes in the morning. Don't stop doing what you're doing. Amen? Amen. Teachers, don't stop teaching. Prophets, don't stop prophesying. Come on, somebody. Evangelists, don't stop evangelizing. Preachers, don't stop preaching. Come on, singers, don't stop singing. Worshipers, don't stop worshiping. Come on, somebody. Witnesses, don't stop witnessing. Christians, don't stop being Christ-like. Don't trade your call in for one little moment under the juniper tree. God doesn't love me anymore. God doesn't know where I'm at. In fact, God just take my life. I'm going to know Elijah was having what we have all the time. Pity party. And guess what? When we have pity parties, we want everybody and their brother to come. Why? Because misery loves company. You know why we're laughing? Because we know it's the truth. Mm. Don't stop doing what you're called to do. Be, remain faithful. Remain steadfast. In fact, you know what? The battle's not ours anyway. The battle is the Lord's. God's got this. God's got this. Now, my question here as we prepare to close is this. And I want you to think about this because, wow, this is powerful. What would have happened if Elijah would have never gotten back up and gotten the game? What if he would have refused the angel's request? And what if he would have stayed there under the juniper tree? Guess what? God would have finally answered his request and he would have expired with not doing what God had called him to do. What would have happened if Elijah would have never got back up and got back in the game? Because don't forget, Elijah mentored Elisha, who later called for Jehu to be anointed as king, and then Jehu turns around and destroys Jezebel. So again, once again, we see the power of the power of one. How many times have we talked about this in the last few months? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus himself and so many others throughout the word of God. Abraham, Moses, Noah, and now Elijah. 
the power of one. The difference that one man or one woman can make. You see, it's the devil who lies to us and says, you know what, just stay home. It don't matter. They don't really care if you're there or not. I mean, you're just, you're not doing anything. It just Don't get involved. Don't pray. Don't go to Bible study. Don't, don't. Just sleep on under the juniper tree. Eat, drink, and be merry. Relax. Have a good time. The world's going to go on forever anyway. The spirit of the age, right? But you know what? We got to shake ourselves sometimes. Hello? We got to stir ourselves up sometimes. We got to stir up that gift that's within us. What's the Bible say about David? David learned how to encourage himself in the Lord. Remember what Bishop's, Bishop Webb said last week? Keep watering the camels. Keep watering the camels. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> My last scripture, praise team, you can come please. Hebrews chapter 6, verses number 10 through 15 here. It says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name. Remember, everything we do is in the name of Jesus for his glory, for his honor, to point people, places, and things unto him. In that you have ministered, past tense, and that you do minister, present tense, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, which is future tense. Okay? So it's not what have we done for God in the past, but the question is, what have we done for God lately? Can I tell you that at the point that Elijah was under the juniper, juniper tree, it really didn't matter that he had called fire down from heaven. And it really didn't have mattered that he had killed 450 prophets of Baal. But the question is, what was he going to do right then at that moment? His whole call, I believe his whole salvation was in that one moment under the juniper tree. What do I do now? Oh, I know he had a great resume. Oh, I know that was a feather in his cap. But how many know when you get to new levels, you fight new devils? Come on, somebody. Oh, I know we go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. But guess what? When we get to the new faith and when we get to the new glory, we're still going to have to fight the same devil that we did back there. Verse number 12. That you be not slothful. There it is. Don't be asleep under the juniper tree, but followers of them who through by faith, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had what? Speaking of Moses here, or I'm sorry, speaking of Abraham here, after he had patiently endured then he obtained the promise can I tell you Elijah didn't go, get to go up in the whirlwind he didn't get to go up in the chariot of fire until he did the right thing at the juniper tree God's like listen Elijah I know what you did for me at Mount Carmel I know how I used you at Mount Carmel, but listen, son, you're on another level now. I'm requiring more of you than even I did at Mount Carmel. Do you believe that I can take care of this evil queen called Jezebel? If you do, then get up and go confront her.
You see, the, 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 the 450 prophets of Baal were just the pawns of Jezebel. They were just the symptoms of Jezebel, but Jezebel was the root problem. How many know sometimes we don't, as humans, we don't want to deal with the root problem. We just like to, we just like to medicate the symptoms. Oh, Jesus, I'm preaching now. Come on, somebody. We don't want to deal with the root problem. We just want to medicate all the symptoms. And God's like, you know what, Elijah, you did a great job on Mount Carmel, but now get up, buddy, because we got a war to win. Come on. You got to go mentor Elisha. He's got to see you go. He's got to get the double portion. He's got to anoint Jehu. Jehu's got to go kick Jezebel's butt. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him it's all part of the plan. Now get, now get this. Praise team, did you come? You didn't come. Did you get up here so I'll quit? What I said earlier about getting this the older I get, is this. Don't worry about doing all the great stuff. How many know, can we be real? We all want to do great stuff. We do, whether you realize it or not, whether you admit it or not. We all want to do great stuff. Why? Because that's part of our human nature. We want to be used by God. We want to be seen. We got, but we got we to gotta keep that under, in check, right? Right? We don't serve the work of the Lord. We serve the Lord of the work. Right? But in doing so, God does use us. But let me, let me say this. Let me throw this into the mix. What if we never get to do the great things? What if we never get to call fire down from heaven? What if we never get to kill, kill 450 prophets of Baal? Are we still going to serve God? Are we still going to be faithful to the call? Because maybe the person that we're raising up is going to be the one who gets to do that. Remember, somebody had to be Mordecai Ham. And who was Mordecai Ham? The person who won Billy Graham to the Lord. You know what? At this time and season in my life, I'm not getting to be a young man anymore. I'm good with just being a Mordecai ham. I'm good with just being Elijah if I don't ever get to kill Jezebel. May I pull, may I pull on the next generation. Come on, somebody. May I pull on the Elishas behind me. Come on, somebody. And I pray that if I go before the coming of the Lord, that they get a double portion of what I had. Oh, stand to your feet. Come on, let's praise him right now. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord, yeah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You see, as children of God, we must learn to be patient and wait on the timing of God. I know you all have dreams and visions. I know you all have promises. But how many understand we've got to put all those things aside and we just have to seek to please God, to be faithful. And you know what? If I don't ever get to kill Jezebel, if I don't ever get to see a great move of God in this house or this city, you know what? I'm going to be faithful to the call of God in my life, and I'm going to do everything I can to pull up the next generation. Come on, somebody. Oftentimes, our greatest victories will produce our greatest battles. But we serve a God who is faithful. How many would say amen? Come on, come down here and stand in this altar with me, and let's just close the service as we wait upon the Lord. I believe our season under the juniper tree is coming to a close. <laughs> I said, I believe our season under the juniper tree is coming to a close. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. 
Oh, somebody come down here and just begin to praise him and thank him.